This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave and indeed to 1977, the year from which this machine came from. This is the Tandy TRS-80, TRS standing for Tandy Radio Shack and the 80 a reflection of the CPU that's inside the Z80, something which set it apart from its competitors from Apple and Commodore at the time. And it was part of what was known as the Trinity in 1977, as we'll learn when we look a little bit more at its history. The reason we have it is all thanks to a man called Bob. Bob very generously donated the machine. He was downsizing his house and he had this in his loft, as well as lots of accessories, which I hope we'll get to look at as the series goes on. But as is tradition in these series, let's learn a little bit more about the history of the machine, take the lid off and see what's inside. You're coming in loud and clear. Must be a realistic CB radio. Ten four good buddies, my new 40 channel realistic. Radio Shack's got it on sale right now for only $79. Save 60 bucks. Best deal I've made all year. Breaker Breaker Rubber Ducky 10-4. In other words, you might have used with your Radio Shack CB radio, a technology they sold by their convoy load, but by the late 70s, sales had started to decline, and Tandy, owner of Radio Shack, needed to find the next big thing. As a company whose average product retailed at $30, it's easy to understand why new, pricey microcomputers might be dismissed by executives, not just because they were expensive, but because they'd have to actually create one first. This was the first wave of home micros, but those execs gave just enough slack for the idea to be tried out. In February 1977, Steve Leininger, who was employed by Tandy specifically to create a microcomputer, revealed his creation. It was the TRS-80. Costing less than $150,000 to develop, CEO Charles Tandy gave the green light for production, but only to 3,500 units. He eventually agreed on this number so that when it failed, which was largely expected by the execs, they could at least use it for stock control management in each of the 3,500 US stores. However, on August 3, 1977, at the New York City press conference, the machine was revealed, promising it could manage the payroll for 15 people in a small business, teach children math, store recipes and play cards. What followed was six sacks of mail, 15,000 phone calls and 250,000 people pledging a $100 deposit to be on the waiting list for the machine. 3,500 units, it's fair to say, was a slight underestimate of demand. And it was in the middle of 1978 before the delivery time dropped to under two months and eventually Radio Shack stores were stocked up and you could walk in and buy one. And here is one such example. This is my TRS-80 with its silver and black plastic housing. It's well used and the plastics are worn where the wrists might have rested, but I quite like the look of it. I think it has a futuristic optimism about its choice of colours. But compared to its rivals, the Commodore PET and the Apple II, the materials used were of a noticeably lower quality, earning this the nickname of the Trash 80. The inclusion of a proper keyboard and not the cash register chiclet style keys of the Commodore PET combined with a retail price of just $399 US dollars or $599 with a 12 inch monitor meant it was the lowest price of the three machines on the market, putting it in a very strong position to compete. Let your children discover tomorrow's technology today. The TRS-80, the biggest name in little computers. Only at Radio Shack, a Tandy company. The TRS-80 was released just two months after the Apple II in August 1977, two months before the Commodore PET, and together these machines were reportedly nicknamed the Trinity by Byte magazine, although tracking down that quote in print is proving tricky. What is certain is that they put home computers in the mainstream. A strong legacy indeed, so what exactly do we get for our money? Keyboard aside, which actually does feel pretty nice to tap away on, 
There's a single red power light on the top of the machine which hopefully won't be able to light up. Early TRS-80s became known as the Model 1 because subsequent versions superseded it like this Model 100 portable TRS-80. And the Model 1 came in Level 1 and Level 2 variants which we'll discuss when we're under the hood. The back of the machine has three DIN sockets for a data set to load programs from tape, video out and power, all with five pins, so you could very easily plug the power cable into say the video output port and I dread to think what would happen. At the other end of the case we have an expansion interface. Early micros often used the S100 bus for expansion which was the first industry standard expansion bus born out of the Altair 8800 computer but the TRS-80 instead uses its proprietary expansion interface, which doubled as a base for the monitor, and it was a particularly troublesome component for Tandy, as we'll discuss later in the series. With no other ports to speak of, the core computer itself here is a good example of an early all-in-one micro that needs only power and a video cable to get started. It really made it accessible to that first generation of home micro owners. And I'm interested to see what's under the hood, I hope you are too. So let's open our TRS-80 up and see what's inside. The first thing I noticed is that some screws are missing, suggesting I'm not the first to open this machine up. Hardly a surprise for its age. What screws remained are sizeable beasts indeed, and I need to source some more to fill those missing holes. Serial number 119981 suggests this isn't a particularly early model, and looking at the paperwork that came with it, I think it was produced around 1980 or early 81. The top of the case lifts off easily to reveal the keyboard, and it's connected by way of a ribbon cable to the main system board. It's something we may need to desolder if we work on this board and likely replace with something newer before it perishes. And here is our system board. It's a two-sided circuit board which is laid out in a nice uniform fashion with the CPU on the right. And that's exactly where we'll start. The 80 of TRS-80 is derived from the Zilog Z80 CPU at the heart of the machine and it's clocked at 1.774 MHz. The Apple II and the PET both had the MOS Technology 6502 CPU running at closer to 1 MHz, so the TRS-80 was no slouch compared to its pricier competitors. We've seen it plenty of times before on the channel, the Z80 is a popular choice in other home micros such as the ZX Spectrum, as well as consoles, arcade boards, MIDI controllers, disc controllers, it pops up everywhere. And hopefully our example is fine, but if not, handily it's socketed so easy to swap out. The TRS-80 came with 4K of RAM as standard, marked on the board from Z13 to Z20. A 16K RAM kit was available, and that it appears is what we have here, but we'll be able to confirm how much usable RAM we have exactly later on if the machine works. Our modules are a mixture of Motorola and Mostec manufactured ICs, which are socketed. There are accounts of people doubling up on RAM modules, soldering one on top of the other to achieve 48k of RAM on the TRS-80 Model 1. No evidence of that here, but we will see a piggybacked IC shortly. The TRS-80 came with a Level 1 ROM originally. That was a 4K ROM written by the TRS-80's designer, Steve Langinger, and it was passable at getting the job done. However, the ROM chips I have suggest this is a Level 2 machine. Level 2 is needed to use a disk drive amongst other things, and it contains BASIC written by Microsoft, who were just two years old at the time of launch. Level 2 ROMs were available from 1978, and older models were often upgraded with a ribbon cable from the ROM socket to a ROM daughter board, and three new ROM chips tucked under the reverse of the system board. However, this is a more refined upgrade. From version E of the system board you could put in two ROMs into the existing sockets, and ours is a G version board, so that's exactly what we have. G is probably the most common board out there, and it benefits from having most of the common faults and bugs ironed out. 
At launch, the TRS-80 could produce only uppercase characters. All of the alphanumeric format to make up the characters are held in the character generator ROM here, in C29. Each character is a matrix of 5 by 7. The lack of lowercase characters shaved $5 off the retail price of the machine, so the penny pinching went beyond the cheap plastic exterior alone. However, look to the right of this chip and we can see that the trace has actually been scratched out. And just a few chips away? See how one chip has mounted the other? You may think this union unnatural, but what we have here is a lowercase character upgrade. The top chip is mounted on a video memory chip and wired up to take on the responsibilities of that original character generator, so we have both upper and lowercase characters available through this chip. The TRS-80 has 1K of dedicated video RAM across 7 chips. 1K means 1024 characters can be displayed on the screen. 6 chips are used for ASCII storage and the 7th is used as a graphic and alphanumeric definition bit. I should point out at this stage that the TRS-80 Model 1 outputs black and white video only. Later models did introduce colour. Getting that video signal out is handled by logic chips, which in competitors' machines may have been consolidated down into a single uncommitted logic array to save space and money. For example, Z8 is our graphic generator. This doesn't actually generate anything, what it does is it breaks down a character. Remember, we can display 1024 on the screen. So it breaks the character down into six cells. We can then use those cells to display something a little fancier than the predefined text characters. Other chips of note include Z6, which controls the horizontal pulse of the composite video output, Z57, which handles the vertical pulse, and then Z5, which merges those signals together, and they are a common point of failure in the machine, which will result in a rolling or a tumbling image on the screen. We will visit this board again to meet more parts, replace capacitors, diagnose problems, but for now this is a high-level overview of some key components, and what I'd like to know is... Does it actually work in its current condition? The original power supply is included with the system. It likely doesn't meet many modern standards, but it may be safe for supervised testing. If we look inside the brick, we'll find a fuse. And often, if they aren't working, it's simply a case of popping in a new fuse, and that's a nice easy fix, which may help some of you. My fuse is just fine though, which is more than can be said about our eight-legged friend here who forgot his personal safety equipment. And a quick check with the multimeter confirms it's outputting the correct DC and AC voltages, and there's no fluctuation in them, so we're good to go for testing with this. Now the TRS-80 was originally sold with an optional Radio Shack monitor, which actually was nothing more than a stripped down TV set. The video signal is composite, so if I make up a cable with a DIN to phono plug, we can plug it straight into my CRT. It's a really simple cable, pin 5 on the DIN should be connected to the ground, that's the shielding on my donor cable, and pin 4 to the single core cable through the middle which carries the composite signal, and, and that's it, it's just those two pins. So with a little bit of tinning and trimming down, I soldered the cable to the pins and had myself a TRS-80 composite video cable. Time for testing, I think, so let's hit the power button. Well, we've got our red light, but the display, well, that's a different matter. We're getting a signal that isn't readable. It's possible that it's my cable. It could also be the signal coming from the TRS-80 that's at fault. And I tried adjusting the horizontal and vertical pots which did change the picture somewhat, but it still didn't become readable. It was at this point that I noticed in the box with the machine, there was another cable, and it looks like an RF modulator. There's a DIN plug at one end, and a coax aerial plug at the other. 
In theory, this shouldn't make any difference, as it would just be modulating the same composite signal, but I plugged it in and gave it a go, we have nothing to lose, and I was surprised after a bit of tuning we got a different result. It wasn't a working machine, but it was a readable output, and this didn't make any sense to me unless I was being a complete idiot. And guess what? I absolutely was. I'd soldered my composite cable the wrong way round. What can I say, it's been a long week. So I swapped them round, pin 4 to 5, 5 to 4, and now I should have a good composite cable. We could have actually done some harm because one of the pins outputs 5 volts, so luckily we didn't solder to that and cause any damage. The RF modulator must have been the method that Bob used on his machine originally, so in my era at least we got to see that in action. So with my working cable plugged in we do have that same message down the screen, it's a question mark, S, T and then a less than symbol. As this is level 2 basic, what I'd expect to be seeing when I power it on is a prompt to input how much memory you have. And on further investigation, what we're seeing on the screen can be a symptom of entering an invalid input at the memory prompt screen. A letter, for example, instead of a number. Perhaps the keyboard is sending an invalid input as soon as we turn the machine on and it's resulting in this behaviour. And that wouldn't be surprising when you see the state of the ribbon cable to the keyboard, it's certainly seen better days. So how about we snip that out with a view to replacing it later anyway, and see what happens when we turn it on. And this time? Yeah, we got the same result, so the keyboard isn't the source of the problem. I did carry out a few other tests, for example if we remove the dip shunt positioned at Z3, which is like a row of dip switches only soldered closed or left open, it allows us to test some but not all of the address lines from the Z80 CPU. It should fill the screen with the at symbol and the number 9, and when we test it, that's exactly what happened, which is positive. If there were any problems there, we would see other symbols than at or 9. The problem then, it appears, is a little deeper. It could be a problem in the video divider chain, perhaps the content of the video RAM is just being shown repeatedly over and over again. It could be a problem in the remaining address lines, and we'd have to get the scope out to test that. It could be a problem with the ROM, with the RAM, any number of things. We've got a lot to test out, and guess what? We'll have a whole nother episode to do it, and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of the problem. Well, having looked at the symptoms and having got past my idiocy in soldering that cable, I think it doesn't seem to be too terminal. There are, of course, problems that we need to get to the bottom of, and maybe we'll pick up some new skills or techniques along the way that we haven't shown in the Trash to Treasure series so far. So I'm looking forward to getting stuck into that. I hope you'll join me in trying to fix this machine. And if indeed you're a TRS-80 expert, or you have some experience of fixing this kind of thing, and maybe you've seen those symptoms before, Feel free to comment, let me know your thoughts, and maybe we can save a bit of time with your pointers. As always, I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you for watching, and take care. Thanks to everyone who watched this episode and especially to the names on the screen. These are the official cave dwellers, the patrons of the channel who signed up over at patreon.com. You can find a link to that in the description of the video if you fancy lending your support. And if you haven't already done so, take a moment to subscribe and come back soon for more videos. Thank you again and take care. Thank you.